Quay, and, and thank you for bringing me into your First Nation. Um, I'm from Eel River Bar, just hop, skip, and a jump over there. And I'm, I'm really thankful that you brought me in. I'm, I'm working with other um, Mi'kmaq communities and on the Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative around issues of identity, members, membership, and citizenship. So. Um, your, your uh, council asked me to come in and just share my research. So that's all this is today. It's just information. You can consider it, ask lots of questions, ignore it. It's, it's up to you. Really, I was just brought in to be a resource to kind of share um, all of the information that we've been gathering all across the country on uh, what First Nations are doing and how they're struggling with deciding whether or not they want their own membership code, whether or not they want to go into self-government, whether or not they just want to leave things as is or do something completely different. And everybody is doing something different. And I think that's important to know that there's no uh, one way to do things. But uh, the first presentation is really about all of the complications of Indian status, how it works, how it came about, uh, and how it impacts how we view ourselves as Mi'kmaq or Ilnu people. And then in the afternoon, I'm giving a presentation on band membership. And that's completely different from Indian status. And that's something that a lot of um, First Nations struggle with, understanding that these are now two very different things. And they have different questions and different considerations. So tomorrow is really about uh, some of the legal considerations. Um, when people are developing codes or just dealing with governance in their own First Nations, there's issues around uh, human rights, there's court cases, there's um, uh, Mi'kmaq political uh, and governance issues, there's Mi'kmaq laws, and how do we incorporate all of these things to make sure that each community or First Nation is doing what is right for them in terms of uh, citizenship. And then the last part is really the one that most First Nations get the most out of. Uh, it says group exercises, but really we go through different fact scenarios. And sometimes when you're going through individual fact scenarios, that's where you see, it really highlights what the problems are in, in addressing membership going forward. Some issues seem simple. You would never just exclude all men or just exclude all women, for example. That seems very simple. But when you start going through fact scenarios, it gets a lot more complex. So like I said, it's really up to you how you want to run the next two days. And these, these presentations, the first one is pretty, um, it's pretty complex in places. So ask questions as I go. And you know, if it's something that's going to be covered in a different presentation, I'll tell you. But it might be too difficult to wait until the end to ask your question. So if there's something you don't understand right away, just let me know. And I, yes, I will be talking about the most recent Daniels case uh, that came from the Supreme Court of Canada, as well as the, uh, I think it's Deschanel case that uh, came out of Quebec and how that will uh, or will not impact things. So just let me know. Um, in terms of my background, aside from being from uh, Eel River Bar, uh, I have four university degrees where I have focused all on First Nation laws, First Nation policies, uh, governing structures, and all the laws and policies that impact us negatively or positively. Um, my, my master's thesis was really on border crossing rights and our status as nations and the Jay Treaty and uh, my doctor was specifically on Indian status and band membership and how we've been impacted uh, over all of these generations by the federal government. And then I've worked uh, with different First Nations all across the country from everything from election codes to water laws, uh, governance, murder to missing Indigenous women. It's really different depending on where you go. But the one kind of common struggle where the issues seem to mostly be the same across the country, whether it's Cree or Mohawk or Mi'kmaq, is around membership and citizenship. Uh, it's, it's really been a struggle in some communities, and in some communities, they can't even have the conversation. 
So you can't get people in a room to even talk about it. That's how personal it is, and that's how um, very difficult it is. So it's really good to see uh, so many people here. Um, so here's the important thing to note. This presentation and what I'm doing here, I'm not promoting Indian status, and I'm not promoting band membership or any federal government policies. I'm not here. Uh, I'm not recording what people are saying or who's here. This is purely like an academic uh, information session. Um, I'm not the band's lawyer, and I'm not their consultant, so I'm not here on behalf of chief and council. I think that's really important. This isn't consultations. Uh, it really is just information sharing, so please feel free to ask questions. It won't be used against you in a court of law in the future, <laughs> just because I am a lawyer. Um, so the first part is Indian status, and you, you might... The reason why I have focused so much research on something that's hurt our people so much is so that we can decolonize. It is so that we can get back control over who we are and, and where we want our nations to go. Um, and Canada has, has held control over First Nation identities for a really long time. And, but when you think of it, in the grand scheme of things, it's actually been relatively a short time because we've been here since time immemorial, we always were in control of our own identities. So it's only been in the last 150 years that there's been interference. It hasn't been extinguished, but there's definitely been interference. And of course, under the Indian Act and many other federal laws, there is still gender discrimination against women that's being addressed in the courts and currently at the United Nations. And the idea is that it's, it's hard for us to have these discussions unless we all have the same background context and information. So I couldn't walk into a room full of accountants and have a discussion about whether a budget is good unless I actually have a copy of the budget and, and know what the previous year's budget were and what the projections are. You really need all of the context in order to, um, to, to think about these things. And so when I talk about Indian status, I never start with the Indian Act. Because first and foremost, since time immemorial, we have been Mi'kmaq, Ilnu people, completely irregardless of the Indian Act. And traditionally, across this territory anyway, there was about 60 to 80 traditional nations, and they all had their own concepts of who they were and who could belong and who couldn't. Um, and we weren't just hunter-gatherers. And I mean, I don't have to tell anyone in this room that, but when we're making submissions to the United Nations, we, we have to constantly remind them, we weren't just cultural groups. This isn't just a multicultural issue. We're actually governments, nations with complex laws and systems, and all of those systems are still there. They're interfered with, but they haven't been displaced, and that's important when we're going to talk about citizenship. And when we did the research, all across the country for what traditional nations used as uh, ideas of citizenship, not First Nations like the individual bands, but the traditional nations, so Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Cree, uh, Mohawk, we found some uh, commonalities. One, that they're obviously all based on traditional laws and customs and stories and, and values about the, the uh, nation, and that they were all a relational concept. So when people talked about who they were, it was who they were related to, what territory they were from, um, whether they live in moose territory, you know, we're the people where we hunt moose in this area, or whether we're from uh, a, a river that has lots of salmon. So it was always talked about in terms of who we're related to. And the other thing is that it, uh, citizenship was equally about benefits as it was obligations. There was nothing in any of the traditional nations and, and the research that we found that showed that people could just say, hey, I'm Cree, and because I'm Cree, I get a moose this year and a fish this year and a duck next year. It didn't work that way. If you were Cree, first of all, you had obligations to your elders, to your family, to the nation, to defend the nation, to you know, protect the lands and waters. That was first. The benefits were incidental. And you can see over time that the federal government has changed that ideology to what you get first versus what your obligations are. We rarely have conversations around what the obligations are in terms of identity. And 
The other thing for every single one that we looked at was it's a birthright. It's something that happens automatically. It's not something you apply for. It's not something you debate. It's not something you serve an apprenticeship for. That being a Cree or being Mohawk or being, um, you know, uh, Niscapi, that was all a birthright. You were born into your family. You were born into your local territory or house or clan or nation. And that's consistent all across the board. And that's, that was, those were some pretty important findings because when you're looking at how we talk about membership today versus citizenship in the past, everything has changed. It's not that way anymore. The other thing about it was that in every uh, traditional nation, the concept of who was a citizen or not was generous because nobody ever mentioned blood quantum in any of these traditional nations. It wasn't about whether you were half Maliseed and half Mi'kmaq. None of those things ever came into consideration pre-Indian Act. The other thing is that, I mean, there were lots of First Nations or uh, Indigenous nations that even would include prisoners. So long as they agreed to learn the language and, and do service to their nation, um, they ended up becoming citizens. And that's, they talked like nations, so like countries or states. They were more political in nature as opposed to biological in nature. Uh, and the other thing was, citizenship was never tied to a scarcity or surplus of resources. So think about how we talk about band membership today. Oh, well, there's not enough houses or there's not enough education money. Whereas in the past, citizenship was automatic, it was a birthright. You could marry in, you could absorb other prisoners, and then the collective nation would figure out how to provide for everybody. And that's no different than any other country in the world, in fact. Canada doesn't ever say, oh darn it, we have a big deficit this year. All the babies born next year, they don't get anything. They don't get any health care or schooling or housing. It doesn't work that way. But Canada was very smart in that not only did it want to eliminate Indians out of the Indian Act, it started tying benefits to certain uh, ranks of blood quantum so that everyone would focus on the getting and not on the fact that they were being eliminated out of the Indian Act. And that's the, tr the research on how, how we used to act as traditional nations really bolsters the fact that Canada has no say, they have no concept, they have no idea what it means to be an Indigenous person. And the relationships, I think the other important part about this is that the, the research showed that the how we talked about relationships wasn't in terms of proximity or remoteness. So today, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, that's you know, my distant relative, or that's a future generation. In the past, when we talked about our relations, we were equally as related to our ancestors that died 10 generations ago as we were to the generation that hasn't been born yet. It wasn't seen as lineal, where you're just going back, back, back. There's one pure person, and then everybody else is either really far back or really far forward. It was a circle where in the same space and time, you're equally related to all of your ancestors and all of your future generations, which was something that was a little surprising because you don't uh, hear many people talking about that today. Um, and that it wasn't just relationships with people. It was relationships with the plants and animals and the lands and the territory and the government and even your relationships with other uh, First Nations and all of your obligations. And so this research, was re it's really important to understand where we came from, to understand how Canada has changed. And when I first started doing these community sessions, some people would say, yeah, but treaties changed all that. We gave up everything in the treaties. You know, we're now citizens of Canada. And in fact, none of that's true. Under all of the treaties that impact Mi'kmaq, the Mi'kmaq nation here, they actually said, there was no transfer of jurisdiction. We never said we're surrendering. You can tell us who we are. There was um, even the Royal Proclamation referred to us as nations. And in every single treaty, the treaty beneficiaries are our heirs and our heirs forever. 
And so there's no time limit. There's no quantum. There's no formula. There's no application for that. Mi'kmaq treaty beneficiaries are the heirs and the heirs forever. So on a go-forward basis, how our, treaty, how our ancestors negotiated treaties are a consideration in terms of how we're going to move forward. And here's some really important points. Because when we signed those treaties, there was no Indian Act. So we didn't agree to incorporate the Indian Act into our treaties or our status as nations. There was no Indian Act when the Royal Proclamation was issued and said we recognize all of your lands here and uh, as Indian nations. No Indian Act at all. We didn't surrender our sovereignty. Um, and the very first Indian Act did not explicitly extinguish our right to determine who we are. And that's important because the Supreme Court of Canada says while laws may interfere with your rights, if they don't specifically say you don't have that right anymore, then it's not extinguished which means our right is still very well uh, alive and uh, working should we choose to use it. And the other important thing is we weren't citizens of this territory or of the state of Canada until 1956. So if we weren't citizens, what were we? We were Mi'kmaq citizens of our nation. And that has been the case except for the last 60 years. So 60 years is a very small time frame to interfere with our own nationhood status. And it's something that Canada falls down on every time we make uh, arguments in litigation. And the other really unique thing about our territory is that we are one of, if not the only places in all of Canada that not only has all unceded Mi'kmaq territory, completely unceded, but we also have treaty rights in addition. In most First Nations across this country, they either have treaty rights or they have Aboriginal title, unceded territory. Not us, we have both. We have the maximum power we could possibly have in our territory. We have, by all means, all of the power at our hands to do whatever we want in terms of bolstering nationhood and, and having discussions around citizenship. And that's really important. We're not limited in any way, except by the ways in which we let ourselves be limited. So while, while they're here, while they're making contact, while they're trying to take all of our lands and resources, they had two very specific policy objectives. And how do we know this? Because there's tons of government documents where all of the colonial governments wrote down, what's our objective here? And it was to take all of our lands and resources, one, that's not a shocker, and two, was to reduce or eliminate any financial obligations that they had acquired by treaties or other agreements. So those two policy objectives have never changed. They are still the policy objectives of Indian affairs. So no matter how many nice people you know that work there and how many people that try to help, at the end of the day, the powers that be, those are the two objectives. Now, Indian Affairs' mandate is a little different. Their mandate is to make us healthy, sustainable, uh, wonderful communities with, uh, with uh, booming economies. That's their mandate. But nothing in that mandate says recognize treaties, recognize land, recognize the right to be self-determining. And that's a problem for us, especially where we're on unceded territory. Now, when you're developing policy, because they had people in Europe trying to develop policy for this territory, they made several really problematic assumptions. Obviously, uh, one, that we were inferior, that we were just about uh, hunting and fishing and that we had no other um, ways of being, and that we were slowly dying off, so we were temporary. Their policies didn't have to look long term. They didn't have to think about a relationship. They didn't even have to worry about treaties because in their minds, we're literally, if the scalping laws didn't get us, something else would. And so that's, that's the mentality that went into those who were trying to draft the Indian Act. Now, the other thing that's important to note is that it wasn't just government people that had a hand in how the Indian Act was created. 
there's actually philosophers and researchers and uh, lots of academics and thinkers from Europe saying, here's how you need to address the indigenous problem all over the world, so wherever uh, Europeans were exploring. And they based it on racist ideologies around the fact that we were subhuman. And why did they do that? They knew we were human. I mean, even their contemporaries, even the missionaries were saying, hey, these people are actually humans too. They have two arms, two legs, and speak. Uh, but it, it served a purpose. If they could call us sub or non-human, that justified, under international law, them taking all of our territory because it would be considered terra nullius. And terra nullius means there's no humans inhabiting this area, so we get to take it. So it was really less about problems with our culture and the alleged culture clash and more about just justifying the legal theft of our lands and resources. We know that's not the case. Of course, we were human. Um, and these policies have been repudiated since, but the practical effect is still here. The vast majority of our lands and resources are with someone else. And they brought in so-called scientists to come up with traits, and they started in the United States and in Australia and brought it into Canada about who's an Indian and who's not. And so they decided they would make it based on biology. And they used old-fashioned horse breeding and dog breeding criteria to determine who would be a native person. So eye color, hair color, skin color, the size of your head, your cheekbones. And that would determine arbitrarily who would be in and who wouldn't be. The interesting thing is when they started this in the, in the tribes in the United States, they would line people up on a big set of tables, a whole family, and half of the brothers and sisters would be considered native enough and the other half wouldn't because their hair wouldn't be dark enough or their skin wouldn't be dark enough. It was completely arbitrary. It had nothing to do with identity. The other problematic science that they used was something called eugenics. And eugenics is where you try to cleanse the human population of anyone who is considered undesirable. So someone who is sick, someone who is aggressive, uh, someone who doesn't fit your mold of blonde hair and blue eyes. So Nazi Germany is very famous for using eugenics, but eugenics started here many, many, many decades before the Germans used it in, in, in Nazi Germany. And the idea was they were trying to come up with a way, a legal way, to breed Indians out of existence. That was their terminology, to breed us out of existence. And that's how the Indian Act was designed. It had nothing to do with culture or identity, but how to breed us out of existence. And so, it was one of the policies that they used in addition to elimination. So you've got assimilation and elimination. Elimination is all of the scalping laws, the forced sterilizations of, of thousands of indigenous women and little girls, all of the smallpox blankets. Those kinds of things are how to just get rid of people physically. But assimilation wasn't just losing your culture and language. It was also making sure that at some point in time in the future, there would be no legally recognized Indians. And once they got all that together, then they crafted the Indian Act. And people say, you're just, you're just assuming they had a bad intention. Surely they didn't mean it that way. Well, in the thousands of government documents that we looked at, it was very clear that that was their express intention. They didn't even hide it. That the idea was to make sure there wasn't a single Indian in Canada. That's pretty clear coming from the Deputy Minister of Indian Affairs. Or that we're talking about the final solution, i.e. there being no more Indians. And that the, the goal really was in gradual assimilation and their target, first of all, were going to be Indigenous women. Because they knew Indigenous women were the ones that raised the children, they passed on the language and culture, so they said, if we have to pick on one group first, we're going to go after Indigenous women. And that's how they formed the Indian Act. And so you have 1868 was the first act, and basically they said any Indian, they created this one race of Indians, which had nothing to do with being Maliseet or Mi'kmaq. 
And it was based on whether you had Indian blood, whether you resided amongst Indians, or whether you were married to an Indian. But that, that actually resulted in too many Indians being on the Indian list. So the very next year, they changed that act and said, in fact, any Indian woman who marries out, she's going to be excluded, and we're going to start tying entitlements to blood quantum and blood quantum to identity. And this is the very first time where you see the federal government saying, Indianness is tied to money. And that has been the undoing ever since. And then, at least in 1869, enfranchisement, where you could give up your Indian status and just be a Canadian, was voluntary. But it was only voluntary for a very short time because that didn't get rid of enough Indians. So since 1876, the really the first Indian Act, the real Indians are male Indians with male blood and the male kids of male Indians with male Indian blood. That is the basis of the Indian Act and it hasn't changed over time. Different people have been added and taken away, but every single Indian Act amendment since 1876 holds that the only real Indian is a male Indian with male blood or the male child of a male Indian. That's never changed. Um, there's, it's under complete federal control. First Nations have absolutely no say. It was largely carried out by Indian agents, which varied by region. So not everybody was included. It's, a, it's, it's one of the myths that Indian Affairs has, has promulgated. And here in the Maritimes, it's much worse. They actually just in the Maritimes, used to purge ban lists and take people's names off ban lists by the thousands. There's thousands of people in the Maritimes that have been excluded and there's no process for ever putting them back on the list because they don't qualify as a Bill C-3 or Bill C-31 or under any of the amendments. So there's lots of our people who are still very much excluded. Now, in 1951, the major change they made was to set up an official registrar so that instead of all the Indian agents deciding who was an Indian and who wasn't, you actually had one person sitting in Ottawa who had the full and sole power to add people as Indians or take them away as Indians. And Indians under the 1951 Indian Act, you were considered an Indian if you were an Indian 1874 and be, uh, before, a male person descended from a male, the legitimate child of a male, or the illegitimate child of a female, unless someone in your community protested, and most of the time the Indian agent protested. So you can see in 1951, the focus is still very much on the male line. And that hasn't changed. It's been amended and tweaked a little bit, but it is still the basis of the Indian Act. The exclusions in 1951 are famous, and you probably know Jeanette Corbière Laval and her court case. Basically, males were included, and all the people that were excluded included uh, Indian women who married out and their children, and something called the Double Mother Clause People. And I don't know if you know what that is here, but it essentially means that any boy who reached the age of 21 whose mom and paternal mom had gained Indian status, so they were white women who gained Indian status, they could potentially lose their status at age 21. But that rule wasn't around long enough, so less than 200 men ever lost their status from that. But don't worry, they all got it back. It's just the women who still have an issue right now. So what did that mean? What are the numbers? So the Indian Acts up until now meant that 16,000 Indian women lost their Indian status, and that doesn't include all of the children that lost their Indian status. This is just the women. But more than, more than 16,200 non-Indian women gained status. And the reason why I put a plus there is because non-Indian women are still being added to this day. Even though that's not under the Act anymore, they're allowing non-Indian women retroactively to go back and be added to Indian status. So the number creeps up every day. So about once a year I make a request to Indian Affairs to find out how many non-Indians are being added 
to the Indian status list. Um, so what, what you can see here, and at the debate at the time was in communities after all of the residential schools and after the Indian Act being in place for so long, communities are saying, well, it's the woman's fault because she's marrying out. You know, why are they marrying out to non-Indians? Well, actually, Indian men were marrying non-Indians at higher rates than Indian women, but they didn't lose any privileges. So why was it bad for Indian women and not for Indian men? The interesting thing, and I don't know if, if many of you know this, but under the Indian Act, anyone can lose their Indian status. It's not protected. They have a whole group of people at Indian Affairs who review files, and if they find it was done in error, they, will, they can take your status away. There's only one protected group, and that's non-Indian women who gain status. They are the only group under the Indian Act who can never lose their Indian status ever. The federal government has by policy said, we will never take rights away from non-Native women who gain status because that wouldn't be fair. But they will, can and do, do it to Native men and Native women. Uh, so all those men who lost their status at age 21 got it back. All the women, and Native women and their kids who ever lost status under the Indian Act haven't all gotten it back. Uh, but don't think for a minute, don't think for a minute that First Nations were sitting around saying, okay, well, we don't mind that this is happening. Since the time the first Indian Act was created, First Nation leaders have been lobbying the government saying, you can't do this to our people. Now, here's something that's important to note. All of these amendments up until 1985 were all made by Indian Affairs. It was Indian Affairs trying to mess around with the formulas to see how they could get rid of people faster without causing too much of an uproar. So it was them uh, playing with the Indian Act. There was no consultations on any of the amendments prior to 1985. Uh, status, Indian status or registration, and band membership were identical. Prior to 1985, if you were registered as an Indian, you were automatically put on a band membership list. After 1985, that's not the case anymore. Uh, loss of status pre-1985 for the majority of people meant forced relocation off reserve. So it's not like today where we have our non-status kids living with us or our grandkids. Pre-1985, for the majority of First Nations, it meant they had to leave. Um, and Indian agents had a great deal of control. And here's, here's the problem. In some First Nations, every single Native woman who had a baby, the Indian agent would protest that baby off the list, even if everyone knew the father was Native. They did automatic protests for anyone who was unmarried. So that meant there's literally tens of thousands of kids in this country who are not status Indians because the Indian agent protested them off but would otherwise qualify for Indian status. And in the Maritimes, unlike anywhere else in Canada, thousands have been left off the list because here's what the Indian agent would do. They got instructions from Ottawa, and Ottawa said, Ottawa said there's too many Indians in the Maritimes. You need to purge the ban lists. Find ways to get people off of the ban lists. So they would. Some Indian agents would do it randomly. Others would post a notice in the community uh, when everyone was away hunting and fishing and say, these are the people I'm going to put on my list. If you have any concerns, let me know by the end of the day. Well, nobody's in the community, so no one says anything, so all of those people go off the list. They did that a great deal in Nova Scotia and in New Brunswick. So our population should be more than double of people who should be on our ban lists. But they were excluded because government said, purge the lists, they're too big, keep getting rid of them, which is something that wasn't happening to the same extent out west. They focused primarily on the Maritimes. This was the primary point of colonization, and they wanted to make sure that the, um, there were no Indians left in the Maritimes. So, as you know, Sandra Lovelace from Tobik challenged that. She went to the United Nations and didn't challenge it based on Canadian laws. She used international law and said, I was married to a non-native and I lost my Indian status and I had to move off reserve. My husband left me 
I want to go back to the reserve. And Canada said, no, once you're a non-Indian, you can't ever go back. So this interfered with her ability to live with her people, partake in the culture and the powwows and the ceremonies, and the United Nations agreed and said the Indian Act denies women the right to partake in their culture. They weren't talking about status. They were saying that the federal government's rules keep her from enjoying her culture. And as a result, that violates international human rights laws that Canada signed on to. Now, what, so what's the result? The United Nations has no enforcement mechanism. There's no United Nations police that came to Canada and said, Canada, we're going to put you in jail unless you change this for Native women. The reason why this change came about is because the first Prime Minister Trudeau was working really hard on something called the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which guaranteed equality to men and women. And that was his policy. And he went for years promoting gender equality, gender equality, gender equality. So at a time when he wanted to pass the Constitution Act 1982 and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, he had this international embarrassment on his hands. So he was forced to make amendments to the Indian Act. Now, had this happened under, say, Prime Minister Harper, <laughs> there was nothing you could do to embarrass that Prime Minister. So it would have been a very different outcome. So it's not just because the United Nations said this. The politics at the time allowed us to put pressure to say you need to deal with it. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't deal with all of it. So this is what we have now. The Indian Act 1985, before the C3 amendments. These are all the different categories of who's an Indian. Now, Section 61A is considered the gold star of Indian status. That's where everyone wants to be. Those are the original Indians, the Indians who were Indians prior to 1985. These are where all the non-native women are and all the non-native children are all in this section. It's a protected section. Primarily men in this section. Now, Section 61B are new Indians. For example, I'm going to walk into Newfoundland, look at this group and say, boom, you're Indians. That's the section you use, the Section 61B uh, section. Now, Section C, uh, 61C Indians, those are all of the people who were deregistered because of the double mother clause. So those 200 men, when they got reinstated, they didn't get to go back to 61A, which they used to be in. They had to go in the Section 61C section. And all the Native women who lost their status didn't get to go back to 61A. They had to go into Section 61C. So you're now known as the reinstatees, the Indians who are no longer Indians who are Indians again. So this is the section that's almost all women, except for these 200 men. These ones, uh, D&E, you don't have to worry about. They're people who got uh, mission orders. But 61F are all the status Indians today that have two parents who are status Indians. So even kids who have two status Indian parents don't get to go into gold standard 61A. You're a 61F. So you're not protected. And then, of course, there's the section 6-2 which you get registered under if you only have one status Indian parent. And what's the difference? Why do you want to be in a 6-1 and not a 6-2? A 6-1 Indian can pass on their Indian status to their kids no matter who they have kids with. A 6-2 Indian can't do that. So the, the buck stops at 6-2. Nobody wants to be in the 6-2 category, and it's a new category created in 1985 because they thought if we can impose a second generation cutoff date to men and women, they'll all be ex uh, extinguished faster. They'll be extinct faster. And the minute they put Section 62 under the Indian Act, they could calculate an extinction date for every First Nation in this country. And that's the research that I was doing for my project, looking at, wow, this community is going to be extinct in 35 years, this one's going to be done in 75 years, this one's in 60 years. And they count on the fact that we really don't like talking about this issue for the time clock to run out. There are some First Nations that are almost all 6'2 Indians. So this is the demographic reality 
of what we're looking at in terms of the Indian Act in 1985. How did they set it up? Well, they said everyone who's in the 6-1 category will be considered 100% blood. And it's arbitrary because there's lots of non-native women and non-native children in this category. It's not real blood. It's, it's what's called a fictional or notional blood quantum. It's not based on reality, you just say it. And then 6-2 is a fictional 50% blood quantum. And then they do their calculations from there. And anyone who has 25% or less, like uh, an NSI means non-status Indian. And when I use the term non-status Indian, it doesn't mean anyone who claims to be Indian. It means the kids and grandkids of status Indians who don't qualify. That's what a non-status Indian is. Um, so it guarantees le legislative extinction, but here's another way of looking at it. Because here's the formula they use to determine how to quickly extinguish Indians out of the Indian Act. A 6-1 plus a 6-1 is a 6-1. That's pretty easy. A 6-1 plus a 6-2 is a 75% Indian, but you're, you're still good enough to be considered 100% Indian. So they'll bump your 75% status up to 100%. Now a 6-2 plus a 6-2 still equals a 6-1, because you're above the 50% 50 50 threshold, they will imagine that you're really 51%. Now, the difference between this side and that side, this side is mostly men. When you get to the other side, which is mostly women, you see a huge change. So a 6-1 plus a non is a 50%er. But that 50% is a real 50%. That 50% gets you 6-2 status and you can't pass on your status. Not like the men over here who when they have 50%, they're bumped up to 100%. Then you have a 6-2 plus a non equals a non. That's it. You cannot pass on your Indian status. And two 25% equal 25%. Two 25s don't make a half. Two quarters don't make a half but two halves make a whole. So people wonder, what's wrong with European math? How come two quarters don't make a half, but two halves make a whole? And the reason is this. It was never designed to create Indians. This is a formula to eliminate Indians. So if you're going to get rid of Indians, because we're really good baby makers, you have to find a way to jig the math so that it does eliminate you. And that's the way it is. Now, this is a very simplified picture, because as you know, there's 6-1-A, B, C, D, E, and F. But this is how the formula works. That's how it's applied today, with no exceptions. Now, Sharon McIver said, that's a load of crap. Even though Lovelace was able to win her case at the United Nations, all Canada did was mess around with the Indian Act a little bit and made sure that all of the people they added would be offset by all of the people they could get rid of under Section 6-2. So we didn't actually gain any more people. You end up losing a lot more in the end. And Chair McIver said that's, that's not a dealing with uh, gender discrimination. So she advanced an equality claim. Under Section 15 of the Charter, it says you have to treat men and women equally under the law. It's as simple as that. And she said the Indian Act doesn't do that. Basically, the way the Indian Act works is all of the kids and grandkids of men are protected under the Indian Act. But the kids and grandkids of Indian women are not. They either have lesser status or no status. And that's today. So she said we have to do something about this. Um, she didn't challenge Section 6-2. She was only challenging all of the gender discrimination in the Indian Act. And she won. The trial court says that the blood quantum is, is arbitrary and that blood, even a fictional notion of blood, has nothing to do with who you are as a person. You could be 100% native but don't know any of your people, don't live anywhere near your territory, don't know anything. 
Or you could be 50% pretend blood, but live in your community, speak the language, uh, help the elders, do all of those things. So the court said, it's of no force and effect. So because Section 6 of the Indian Act violated the Constitution, the judge said, Section 6 doesn't exist anymore. That's a huge pronouncement to make. But they said, we will delay it until the government has a chance to make the amendments. And the trial judge was very clear about, here's how you make the amendments to the Indian Act. It's simple. No more gender discrimination. So men and women are treated equally under the Indian Act. However, you have to change the words. No more gender discrimination. That's it. Of course, the government appealed that case. And at the Court of Appeal, they said, yeah, we agree. There's gender discrimination. It's illegal in our country. So Section 6 is of no force and effect. It doesn't exist. But they gave them a year to amend the Indian Act. The problem was, the appeal court said, you know, we feel sorry for the federal government. It must be hard trying to come up with all of these rules on, on who's an Indian and who's not. It's very complex. So we're not going to tell them how to do it. We'll just let them do it themselves. But when you let the federal government do it themselves, they decided to amend the act only to include people that fall under Sharon McIver's exact fact-based scenario. And everybody else would be excluded. So it didn't remedy gender. So Sharon applied to the Supreme Court of Canada and asked them, will you hear an appeal? And the Supreme Court of Canada said, no, we won't hear the appeal. That doesn't mean that they agree with the Court of Appeal. It just means that they didn't consider it to be a national issue. We all think they were wrong, but Sharon McIver didn't stop there. She went to the United Nations and has filed and gone through all of the United Nations processes to bring a human rights claim against Canada and the decision could literally be out any day. We think, politically, they were probably waiting for Harper to leave. But nevertheless, there's a United Nations case pending. So after McIver, the federal government and all of their justice lawyers, the two who understand the Indian Act, got together and decided, how are we going to amend the Indian Act to reflect only McIver's scenario? And that's what happened when you got Bill C-3. So the first thing they had to do is they had to reenact Section 6. They said the court said it's of no force and effect, so we're just going to legislate it again. It's now back into force and effect. So 6-1-A's, because they had to protect all of those uh, Native men and non-Native women that are in Section 6-1-A, they made sure that they were protected. But then for the rest, they created a new Section 6-1-C, which is a Section 6-1-C, C.1. And because they, they refuse to put the women back into the 6-1-A category, they keep creating new ones. So that they could include the kids of Indian women who married out. But here's, here's the clincher. For Indian affairs to determine Indian status under the Indian Act, they go by who are your parents, what kind of status your parents have. It's been that way since the Indian Act was created in 1876. When they made this amendment, if you wanted a remedy, not only did you have to have status Indian parents, but you had to have kids, and those kids had to be non-status Indians, or you didn't get to go into this section 61C1 category. So anyone who had been forcibly sterilized during Canada's policies and didn't have kids couldn't get a remedy. Anyone who has a health issue and couldn't have kids didn't get a remedy. Anyone who just didn't want kids didn't get a remedy. And they're the only group out of the whole Indian Act ever in its history where who your parents are and who your kids are determine whether or not you get status. So it only applies to Native women. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, and the other important thing they did was, in 1985 when Bill C-31 came in and they reinstated all of the Native women who had married out, they said, the government said at the time, because the Charter of Rights, equality between men and women, didn't exist prior to 1985, we're not liable for all of your lost education, housing, treaty rights, or any monies you should have got. Because the Charter wasn't in force then. 
When McIver won her case, the charter hadn't been in force for decades, so they knew they stood to lose millions of dollars in all of the treaty benefits, education, housing, tax exemptions for all of these women and their kids. So they put a provision in the act saying, and we're not paying anybody anything, we're not liable. So they essentially, and it's the only group in the history of Canada that when you've been found to be discriminated against and it violates the charter, you don't get compensation just for Native women and their kids. So that's something that a lot of people didn't know about Bill C-3. So now this act creates two new forms of uh, discrimination, not just gender, but um, disability and family status. So like I said, if you don't have kids, you can't get a remedy. The other thing that this did, and, I, and it's very complex, it's very simple in my mind, because I've only talked about it a thousand times, but I know I'm talking about uh, a lot of complex things here, is that after Bill C-3, Indian men and their descendants uh, and their kids are still protected. But the government applies Section 6-2 retroactively backwards to the descendants of Indian women, even before 6-2 even existed, just for Indian women. And people don't understand that that's what's happening. So Cher McIver, that's why she went to the United Nations. She said this amendment to the Indian Act didn't do anything to fix gender discrimination. It, in fact, just made it worse. So you don't have to know this chart. But it basically is a chart that shows pre-1985, post-1985, and post-2010 that at the end of the day, the kids of Indian women and their grandkids have lesser or no status than the kids of Indian men. Despite all of the amendments, it's still the case. And I will give a copy of this to Serge for anyone who wants a copy of this afterwards because it's it's impossible to go through in a minute and understand it. But in every single scenario, without exception, the kids and grandkids of Indian women have lesser or no status compared to the descendants of Indian men. And that's, that's why we have cases like this one. Now, this is a fairly new one. It came out in August of 2015, but it only really got a lot of media attention after Trudeau was elected, and he made the decision not to appeal this case which means he's going to amend the Indian Act again. This case basically said, and this uh, female judge said, that gender discrimination in the Indian Act breaches the Section 15 equality rights between men and women. We, that's very clear. And she said there's no reason for it. There's no government policy reason which says you have to exclude these kids of women or what. Canada will come to an end. So for example, when you put limits on fishing, you do it for a government objective like you want to protect the fish so that they'll be there next year. That's a good reason. But why would you exclude the kids of women? They have no reason. They just wanted to reduce numbers. And that's not considered a valid policy objective. So she went further. She went further than any court's ever done. She said all of these sections of the Indian Act are declared inoperative including Section 6-2. They are of no force and effect. Now, the government has 18 months to amend the Indian Act, and the first thing the Harper government did was file an appeal. They were going to challenge that decision. But once Trudeau got elected, Justice Canada reviewed it and said, no, we're not going to appeal it. We're going to amend the Indian Act to get rid of gender discrimination. So this is where we are. Now, depending on how the Trudeau government determines what will be amended, they will either get rid of all of the gender discrimination under the Indian Act or only the gender discrimination of this case. But given that she's declared all of the sections inoperative, including Section 6.2, presumably the amendments will have to be much more significant. Now, early indications from the people that are working in registration are is that they'll probably set up a parliamentary committee to hear uh, expert testimony from people like Sharon McIver, Native Women's Association, different First Nations, uh, lawyers who can talk about what the implications are. 
but that by not appealing this case, it's the law in Canada, and he has to change the Indian Act within 18 months. That's a massive job, but this is where we're headed. Now, the other case that people have been emailing me and calling me about nonstop since it came out is the Daniels case. This just came out a couple of days ago, last Thursday, from the Supreme Court of Canada. Now, this isn't a rights case. This isn't hunting, fishing. It's not trapping. It's not a gaming case. It was a question asked by the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, a national political organization, and they asked the question to the Supreme Court of Canada, do Métis and non-status Indians fall under federal jurisdiction or provincial? That was the question. And it's called a reference when you just ask a question instead of fight over a, a right issue. And it has been many, many, many years in the making. Canada tried to stop this case from going through. And the court said, yes, Métis and non-status Indians are Aboriginal people. They are federal jurisdiction. The federal government has an obligation to consult with them when they do things that impact Métis or non-status Indian rights. And they have a fiduciary obligation to them. And a fiduciary obligation means you have an obligation to act in their best interests. You can't act in a way that harms them. That's all the case said. It did not say they are registered as Indians. It did not say they get programs and services. It did not say they have hunting and fishing rights. In fact, the Supreme Court of Canada said, we are not talking about Section 35 Aboriginal treaty rights here. We're only talking about jurisdiction. And jurisdiction doesn't require you to do anything. Now, here's a good example. In 1939, the province of Quebec and the federal government asked the same question of the Supreme Court of Canada with regards to Inuit people. They said, are Inuit federal or provincial? And the Supreme Court of Canada said they're federal jurisdiction. They are considered Indians for the purposes of Section 9124 jurisdiction. Did that make them Indians under the Indian Act? No. Section 4 of the Indian Act specifically excludes Inuit people from being considered Indians. Inuit people don't have reserves. They don't have treaty rights. They have modern claims, but they don't have treaty rights. So just because Métis and non-status Indians are considered federal jurisdiction doesn't mean they're automatically under the Indian Act. It didn't happen with the Inuit, and it most likely won't happen with the Métis and non-status Indians. So that, that case has caused a lot of confusion. I mean, a hundred people have called me saying, hey, can you make me a Métis? Can you make me a non-status Indian? I want my house, I want my treaty, I want my tax exemption, and it's like, do you clearly misunderstand the case? So, why does any of this matter? Who cares about Indian status if it doesn't determine your identity? If you're Ilnu, who cares? Well, here's what happens when we don't pay attention for a little while. There have been numerous studies done on what's called outmarriage when you have kids with people that aren't status Indians. That's all outmarriage means. You don't even have to be married. Whenever you have kids with someone who's not registered as an Indian. And they looked at what are the outmarriage rates for First Nations in Canada. And for the vast majority of them, they're moderate to high. And in some of the places, they have a 100% outmarriage rate. But that's not a mistake. It was done like that on purpose. They moved our reserves around and our people around so that we weren't with our nation, we were all divided up into little parts, and that we were in remote locations or by cities so that we had no choice. I mean, honestly, when I was a kid, band membership at Eel River was maybe 300 people. Who am I going to marry? My cousin, my brother, my uncle, I mean, everybody I'm related to. I had no choice. Most people didn't have a choice. Not everyone's like Six Nations, where you have 24,000 people in your community. Uh, and, and the other thing about this is, you don't know, people didn't know. Even today, most people don't know what section they're registered under or what the implications of that are. And is there anything under Lava Life or eHarmony that has a section that says, what kind of status Indian are you? 
There's no formula. You don't go looking for people saying, okay, are you a section 6-1? Are you a section 6-2? Oh, you're just a 6-1-F? No, you're not protect I want the 6-1-As only in this room. And they're an aging population, come on. Think about it. We weren't thinking about ourselves that way. Most people didn't even know. When these amendments came through, this isn't, wasn't in the day of social media. Most women didn't know. Most men didn't know. Most kids didn't know. So our lives were being orchestrated for us without us even understanding the implications. And even if we did know the implications, who is the government to say who we can marry and who we can't and who our kids are and, and who we can't? So this is what happens without marriage. And that's why status is something that we should be talking about because if you take the Indian status rules with the out marriage rates, the extinction dates that Canada set for each First Nation were, prior to C3, between 75 and 100 years. And the extinction rate doesn't mean we're going anywhere. We're the fastest growing population. We make more babies than anyone else. We'll all still be here. But it's when the last status Indian is born. And why does that matter? It matters because, for the majority of First Nations, band membership is based on Indian status. If you don't have any status Indians, you don't have any band members. Oh my goodness, if you don't have any band members, guess what happens in the law? You no longer have a band. There is no longer a legal entity. All of the land, treaty rights, property and resources held by the band would revert back to the federal or provincial crown. Guess who gets it all? And if you have no band members, they don't need to talk to you about treaty anymore because how they interpret treaty beneficiaries is not heirs and heirs and heirs forever. It's whoever's a band member. That's it. So it serves multiple purposes. That's why I'm saying the objective to get our lands and resources have never changed. But it's happening really fast under the Indian Act. And there's a couple in Ontario who will face this in 30 years. So they're scrambling now about how to deal with their uh, membership issues. Now, for it used to be called Restigouche Band Number 51. That's you. Uh, you had in, 19, in the 1980s an out marriage rate of 30 percent, and that's just for your on reservers. That rate has increased, but you have a large number that's off reserve, and the out marriage rates for off reserve people are much higher naturally if you're not in your community. So your rates show that demographically you'll have some initial growth, but after that growth period is done, you will uh, move into a slow decline until you have no members left in the future. There will be no Listagouche at some point in time in the future. That's the future for most First Nations in this country. Unless the Indian Act has changed, or band membership changes that. So in case for people couldn't hear, what she was saying is that maybe if there's less and less and less numbers in Listagush, other bands, will help, Mi'kmaq bands will help out and trans, uh, send people to Listagush or transfer band membership. <laughs> or make a whole bunch more babies. <laughs> um, yeah, so Indian Affairs, I mean, we'll, we'll be talking about band membership this afternoon because band membership, band membership is different and it's very complex. It's different from status. So a person from another band might transfer band membership, but they, if there's no band to transfer into, they wouldn't necessarily save Listagouche as a band because different bands have different membership codes. And sometimes when you transfer into a band, you lose your membership in that band and become in another band, but that's not always the case. Some bands don't believe in that INAC policy, not a law, just a policy that you shouldn't belong to two bands. And then some don't allow their members to transfer out. <laughs> 
because they want to maintain the integrity of their communities. They don't want to lose their communities either. So it wouldn't be the same in every place, but I'll save the band membership stuff for this afternoon. Uh, and why does status matter? So we know that status has been very controversial in our communities. A lot of people identify with the card. They hold out their card and say, I'm a status Indian. So there's definitely an identity uh, thing attached to it. But practically speaking, it determines who qualifies for federal programs and services. It determines who gets the tax exemption. It determines who can run for uh, council, who can vote for council, who can participate in government. And it also determines, to a great extent, who can participate or benefit from Aboriginal and treaty rights. Not because of a law saying that, but because Canada and many of the provincial governments say only status Indians can have Aboriginal and treaty rights. It impacts land claim negotiations because they generally only allow status Indians to participate in land claim negotiations, although the last couple um, have been a bit of an anomaly, or who can be a citizen under self-government agreements. They always have that status Indian ban list, not the membership list, the status Indian ban list. So practically speaking, aside from rights and, and things like that, it determines whether you have a right to live on reserve. Because only Indians under the Indian Act have a right to use and occupy the reserve for which it was set apart. Non-Indians are automatically trespassers unless they're invited in, unless there's some other uh, residency bylaw or something like that. If you're not, if you don't have status, so say your parent passes away and you don't have status, that parent can't leave you their house, they can't leave you their land, they can't leave you any property that's considered on reserve. And that could include all of their money, because Indian monies are often deemed to be on reserve. So it causes a lot of problems when it comes to wills and estates, and we don't know that until unfortunately one of our family members pass. Um, but it's, there's also other practical issues, and it's not in, I find most Mi'kmaq First Nations, but there's other First Nations that you don't even get to come to a powwow unless you have a status card. You don't even get to talk and come and do language uh, training if you don't have a status card. And, you know, I haven't seen that a lot in the Maritimes, but definitely in other provinces, it's, it's like that. It can be very exclusionary. So they can't even access their elders or their language or live with their family if they want to. Um, some kids in some First Nations, because the federal government only pays for the status Indian kids, the status Indian kids get to take the bus to school, and the non-status Indian kids have to walk or get a drive. It's that bad. Now, other First Nations don't allow that to happen. They cover all of the kids in their community. But in some communities, it's that much of a dividing line. And that's why status matters, because as much as we hate it or say we don't want to abide by it, this is what's being imposed. This is how it impacts our communities. Now, people say, why on earth, Pam, are you talking about Indian status? What do you care about these provisions? It's just an act of colonization and it has oppressed our people. And yes, 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 I completely agree. I hate the Indian Act. But so long as it's the Indian Act and so long it's the law and so long as people are using it, it shouldn't be done in a way that excludes half of our population or it excludes our women or kids. That's my view. Um, and that's just based on all of the research that I've done based on how we used to look at things traditionally. Now here's what I, because I give some of these talks to Canadians who want to understand this. And I say, let's, it's so ridiculous that this happens to us, but we've been dealing with it for so long, we almost assume that this is normal. We ask people, how much Indian are you? Oh, really? Were your parents Indian? Are you a 6'2"? Are you a 6'1"? But I say, what if we turn the tables around and started asking Canadians, um, this is what we think a traditional Canadian looks like. This is your regalia. This is what you looked like back in the 1750s. People were, and citizens were only men. So this is how we're going to determine Canadian citizenship. And I don't see a lot 
of Canadians walking around looking like this anymore, so I don't think they're real Canadians. And then, what if we decided to determine Canadian citizenship based on how closely related they were to the founding fathers of Confederation? That's 1867. So every generation since 1867, their blood is losing all of their purity. And maybe there's no real Canadians anymore. Maybe they're all Canadian Métis. What if that was the rule for Canadians? What if we did that to them? Or what if we said every time a Canadian married someone from another country, their blood quantum got wonky, and then they get, lose their Canadian, Canadian citizenship? What if we dared say that? What if we dared say, you don't have blonde hair and blue eyes, you're not a Canadian. Imagine how offended and ridiculous it would be. But to us, we all internalize it and accept that as that's who we are. But that wouldn't happen in any other country. What if we said Canada has a huge national deficit, so from now on, no more health and education benefits for Canadian kids. No more free education. That's a burden on taxpayers. No more free health care for those Canadians. That's a burden on taxpayers. What are they doing with their $9 billion? Imagine if we had those conversations about Canadians. And what if every time a Canadian went hunting or fishing or ate bannock, they were no longer considered Canadian? That's it, you're Mi'kmaq. You get no Canadian benefits. We're revoking your passport. It's stupid and it's ridiculous, but that's what happens to us in the reverse. And the worst part about it is that many of us still accept that about ourselves. And what if Canadians could lose their citizenship just like that. What if there was a whole group of native people sitting in Ottawa saying, you know what, I think I'm going to revoke their Canadian citizenship. No, I think no more men should be Canadians. Boom, 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 boom. They're all off. Imagine if we had that. It, it's the height of ridiculousness, yet they are the only country in the world that does that to its indigenous peoples. Did you know we are the only country left in the entire world that controls indigenous identity. And we do it by phony blood quantum. The only one, Canada's own internal consultants have said, you have no way to justify this in law. None. No way. So, moving forward, what is decolonization? In simple terms, it's when you get the colonizer out of your head. And that's not easy because we don't even know what we don't know is in our head from the colonizer. And sometimes it's just used as another form of lateral violence. Oh, well, he's colonized and I'm decolonized and that guy's colonized thinking. But in fact, it's really the process of learning more and more and more about what happened to us, how it impacts our thinking, how it impacts our relationships, and how we used to think about these things. There's no new solutions needed, really. Most of the problems here could be completely eliminated just by following Mi'kmaq laws. And that's what we found, our research all across the country. The communities who've gotten beyond this are those who've gone back to their traditional laws. Not in terms of it being frozen in time somewhere. So not a law from 10,000 years ago that has no application in a modern context with intermarriages and things like that. But the basic core values around who we are as people. So there's lots of options for First Nations, and I don't come here promoting any of them. You could do nothing. Just stay under the Indian Act for status and membership. That's an option. You could create your own membership code under the Indian Act if you want to, or you could say, screw the Indian Act, I'm going to make my own membership code under Mi'kmaq laws that has nothing to do with the Indian Act. Or you can negotiate self-government, you can engage in litigation, you can do uh, nation-based rules, you can do whatever you want. The whole point is that despite all of this mess that's been inserted into our communities, we're on unceded territory, we've never surrendered our sovereignty, and all of our laws are as equally valid today as they were pre-contact. 
We have Aboriginal title rights, treaty rights. They're all constitutionally and internationally protected. There isn't anything you can't do for your community if you, if you want to. Now, for further reading, if you're like a reading nut, I just included some of my related publications on these things that talk about specific acts and things like that. Um, I'm also on different kinds of social media. For those that are on social media, you can contact me if you have any questions because some of you know all of this stuff, you've been talking about it for decades. And some of you may have never gone through all of these provisions individually and you might need to think about it and ask questions later. Um, it's, it's quite a process in terms of where do you go from here? Because this afternoon, or after lunch, I guess, when we talk about band membership, um, status impacts band membership if you don't have your own code. And then if you have your own code, nine times out of 10, communities get into the debate over the Indian status regulations. So moving into code territory is a long process. And for example, I work with member two in Nova Scotia, and we've been doing it for four years. It's hard, these things are hard. We didn't do these things to ourselves, but we're left to deal with the aftermath. We're the ones now who have to pick up the pieces and try to find a way to talk about it and make decisions going forward, or not, just leave it as is. But I found the majority of First Nations that I work with want to be here in the future, in terms of legal recognition, social, cultural, political, and so they want to have these conversations. Yeah, so now that we've had multiple generations of Indian status, we have scenarios where we're now um, with, say, non-Indian people occupying houses, marrying non-Indians, have non-Indian children, and people are concerned about that. Other communities say they married into our community, they're part of our community, it's no different than the way we used to do it years ago. So people are of all different minds on these things. I've found that if you can take the conversation away from resources and focus on who we are as Mi'kmaq people, then that changes the conversation. I, I think we at least need to talk about it. We don't necessarily have to do anything right away, but I think we just need to keep talking about it until we understand what the implications are. So for the First Nation in Ontario that they won't have any status Indians in 30 years, um, they have no choice. They're forced into a scenario where, okay, our First Nation's gone in 30 years unless we talk about it, unless we take action. So they have to. Some people have much longer to do.